Welcome to E-Commerce Deep Dive, a podcast featuring the biggest players in retail and e-commerce. Your host is John Giorso, founder and CEO of Orca Pacific, a Mighty Hive company. Today, John is joined by Alana Feldman, manager of content strategy and activation at Bayer. Alana discusses her experience working for a healthcare company during COVID. They also discuss content strategy and the importance of brands avoiding a siloed mentality when approaching e-commerce. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Alana, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So um, we were chatting a little bit before we hit record here, just about your history and, and what you're up to today. Um, the position that you have in, in a major CPG is, is fascinating to me because it's quite novel in the industry. And I think a lot of brands could learn from, from your approach. So I'm really interested to get into that. Um, before we do, let's just uh, kind of establish your, your lens, your history, um, uh, a little bit about kind of you know, your, your resume to establish where you're at today, and then we can get into to what's happening kind of in real time. Absolutely. So um, I'm, I'm definitely younger in the industry. So I graduated college, Penn State, uh, we are, uh, graduated Penn State in 2012. And I started with Bayer after a few internships, um, classically found my way there through someone who knew someone. Uh, and Bayer at the time, Consumer Health was really looking to up their game digitally. Um, and someone, one of my friends knew me as kind of they called me a quote unquote digital girl, whatever that meant. But I was into my computer and uh, I was always online and into social in those early days. So uh, I went to Bayer and was on the sales side of the organization, actually, at that time. Um, and digital was super hot. It was when digital shopper marketing was really having a resurgence. Uh, In-store digital was hot. I don't know if you remember all the talk about beacons and uh, NFC in stores, but like the fact that thinking you were going to scan your phone on displays and, and things like that yeah. was a really hot topic. Um, and it was something that I was interested in because I was new to retail, but I wasn't new to the digital world. Um, so I was learning a lot about retail um, and I had done some digital media uh, work in the past. And that was something retailers were just starting to lean into. And it was interesting because our, our traditional sales folks weren't necessarily equipped to have those conversations. Uh, digital media wasn't something that they were used to. They were very much in-store, very much traditional retail folks. So I helped them understand kind of what the retailers were offering and the value of it, and really spent a lot of the beginning of my career within the sales organization, but promoting digital, um, teaching people about this brave new world retail was entering into, uh, and just trying to upskill the organization. Got it. Um, so, so just to yeah. so this is the era where, um, uh, and it, it, it's been over several years. But Amazon, Walmart, Target, the, you know, all the kind of big retailers are launching media groups or partnerships or some way to 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 serve ads basically on their platform. And you have mostly kind of traditional retail salespeople. I'm sure very good at that. You know, knowing the DMM and all, and like you know placement works and all of those things, but, but the advertising side of it's kind of a whole new concept for retail. Is that? Totally. Yeah. And, and at this time we were working with Amazon a little bit, but this was coming from our traditional retailers, right? It was coming from the Kroger's. I remember Kroger 8451 being super early, um, talking to Target and Walmart about just this opportunity, uh, to actually buy, buy and sell media, which was very new and different. Yeah. Great. Um, and then uh, maybe tell us about how you got to kind of, that was on the media side. Tell us about how you got to the content side of, of, of the organization. Yeah, I got, I moved over to content by way of e-commerce. Um, so obviously being in that digital marketing realm, I started just poking my head at e-commerce, right? Like what is this beast and, and how should we be participating in it? Um, and I spent a lot of my time at the organization building the case study for an e-commerce team for us to go sell at Amazon directly um, and, and kind of cut my teeth doing all that e-commerce folk stuff internally. And for anyone who works in e-commerce, you know that content is one of the most important and foundational elements to an e-commerce business. 
So I think just by way of wanting to be best in class in e-commerce, that means being best in class in content. Yeah. Uh, so it really got my focus to that side of the business. Yeah, that that's awesome. So then what is your, you mentioned that um, your role today at Bayer didn't exist before you were in it, um, which I think actually that one statement kind of gives a lot of context about kind of the newness <laughs> and, and where Bayer is and, and really where the industry is. Um, but tell me about what you're actually like tasked um, um, at today, because I think it's super interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, I do too. Um, it's a it's a really cool role. I lead content strategy and activation um, across all the bear consumer health brands. So obviously, you know, we're talking not about pharma, but we're talking about products that are sold in retail um, and all of our consumer healthcare brands. Um, but I'm tasked with leading or helping our brands create holistic content strategies that span the consumer experience. So we talk a lot about different touch points like omni-channel, which would be in-store or e-commerce. We really try to think of the commerce experience as one omni-channel experience. But then that also goes into the social world, both paid and owned, um, as well as brand-owned properties and the content that your brands choose to own themselves on that consumer journey. So my job is really laying out a roadmap and a framework to help our brands capitalize and engage with consumers at the moments that matter most. Yeah, that that's great. And I think, you know, um, we were talking about this before before we hit record as well. But, you know, from from my side, from the agency side, um, I've sort of experienced the I would say the lack of someone in your role in a lot of organizations over the years um, in that. You know, we oftentimes are in a position and still today where e-commerce is kind of the stepchild. So, you know, retail, um, traditional uh, media channels, they're getting all like kind of the big assets. They're involved in the ideation process and the creative process, et cetera. And then by the time you get to e-commerce, you're going, hey, you know, I saw it, I saw a commercial for your or I saw a, you know, a, 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 even a catalog or something where it's like, we have all these great assets and this content, like, where is that? And they're going, I don't know, but you don't have it. You get, you get the image of the front and the back and, you know, and then you get a video which has to work for 700 different items because we just, we have one and it just sort of, and it, and it has nothing to do with the item. So it's like, okay there's there's clearly a disconnect here it's no one's fault it's just sort of this you know big organization siloed problem it sounds like that's i mean is that kind of one of the things that you're tasked with overcoming ultimately absolutely i mean it's obviously on each of our brands to lead that i, I like to call them the conduct i like to call them the conductor of all of their agencies right they're the ones who know the most about their brand i'm trying to help them connect those dots. Yeah. And, and to your point, I think traditionally, e-commerce isn't something you thought of Im immediately, right? Uh, e-commerce wasn't your first channel for distribution, whereas sometimes it is now. Um, so you need to have those conversations upstream and have your individual agencies, right? We have a lot of specialty agencies now who are very specialized and know lots about a certain thing. But bringing all of them together up front and briefing them at the same time and having them bounce ideas off each other and making sure certain experts are sharing must haves right um, early in the process, it makes a much easier opportunity to create content downstream. I think we, we sometimes only have one person in the room when the first round of content is being created. And we need more people to chime in and say, hey, we need this for my channel or we, we need this for my consumer. Um, so starting to have those conversations up front and having people in the room with experience in all of these different places. Um, we're, we're definitely leaning towards more of a general manager mindset. Um, so you have lots of experts at your disposal, but you're able to create that plan um, and really, as I said, conduct it from the middle. Yeah, that's super interesting. So, you know, so so this kind of problem, which I think is one of those, it's it's a problem that needs to be solved. It's it's 
it's a problem that is just sort of inherent in a big organization. You know, the problem is the default. The solution is kind of the innovation. Um, mm. Is it ultimately one of just connecting people? Is there a technological element? I mean, what else? What else is involved here? Um, to to like you know, in a year or two years, whatever you go, yeah, I I made an improvement. I hit my goal here. We clearly are seeing better, consistent results. Like, what are the big kind of macro things that need to change? Yeah, um, it's all of the above. Uh, I like to say it's it's people, process. And technology. So you could okay. say platform and get a little triple P going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so people, platform, and process. Um, but it's everything, right? It's people need to understand how the consumer experience has changed and how it is nonlinear and touch points are different and how people are feeling and the type of content they want to consume at different points in the journey, right? We ourselves need to better understand that. Um, two, processes. Um, our processes were not built for e-commerce. They were not built for real-time social media content creation, right? So developing new processes that are still compliant, but that can meet the speed of today's consumer, absolutely key. And then finally, I said technology, but let's change it to platform for that triple P sure. fun. Um, you have to have internal and external platforms to support this type of work. Yeah. So something that I... Uh, dedicated a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to in 2019 was onboarding uh, the first ever PIM to bear consumer health. Wow. Okay. Uh, and we, we, we did not go Salsify. We didn't, we didn't do um, a plug-in. We really went for a full PIM because we, don't, we needed something to handle master data management as well. Yep. So that is quite an endeavor, and it's not a fun or sexy one. Sure. Um, but it's foundational to be able to have correct and consumer friendly content out there to sell your products. Um, and a PIM is one thing, obviously today you need that to syndicate to retail in some cases, but even a DAM, right? A digital asset management system that agencies and internal partners can access. That's somewhat new as well. Um, to your point, we have these assets, but we don't know where they are is a very common uh, refrain in yeah. the industry. Yeah. So by having centralized uh, platforms where everyone can access these types of content um, is really, really a key point. Yeah, that's great. No, I, I love that. I love that 3P uh, framework. I think I, I think you might have coined something pretty, pretty, <laughs> pretty interesting there. I'd be surprised if we don't start hearing that maybe in the industry. Um, uh, no, I, I think that's fascinating. You know, it might be obvious, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I think it's 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 important to frame this. You know, ultimately, from an outcomes perspective, what are you what are you looking for here? What does success look like? Like when I look at when I go and I you know I I search uh, bear aspirin and you know 2019 compared to 2023, let's say, and I go and I look on Google and I go to Amazon and I go to social and I go to you know Target.com. What is the 2019 experience versus the 2023 experience? Like, what is, what is the improvement? Is it just consistency or is it beyond that? That's a great way to put it. Um, I love how you framed that. I think, yes, absolutely, consistency is key. Um, hopefully, from 2019 to 2023, let's say, you will see much more consistency in availability of data about our products, um, visual information about our products. Um, but I'd like to see even more, right? Uh, custom by retailer content, right? That's something that yeah. I'm very interested in as a shopper myself. Um, we work with some partners like one space, uh, who actually help create custom content based on retailer specific search behaviors. Um, so really learning more about those shoppers and what converts them online. I think I would love to have, I would love for you to see Bear Aspirin have various content at CVS that is very health focused and, and very deep information. Whereas maybe at Target, it's more about the uh, work that they're doing with the American Heart Association, right? So um, I'd love to see more differentiated content by the audience. 
Um, you'll also see a bigger focus on ratings and reviews. Uh, that's been a big push for me as well. Um, I'm a huge advocate of ratings and reviews and have gotten our brands uh, connected in that fashion. So definitely a larger volume of reviews because uh, we know how that affects conversion at retail. Um, I'd also love to see not just in the omni-channel space, right? That's important. It's, it's normally where I go first because of my background, but right on social and brand owned properties today on social, we're, re we're reactive. I would like to say, um, some of our brands are getting much better, but in the social space, I'd like our brands to be engaging with consumers, engaging with followers, um, having that two way conversation about different, um, passion projects that the brands are, are leading. Uh, and then in the brand owned property space where I think there's so much opportunity, uh, people first think of websites, but I think it's so much broader than that. It's, it's where on the consumer journey, is there an opportunity for the brand to provide more value to the consumer? And, and that doesn't mean a coupon on the brand website. That means what can we do, uh, to really help consumers or bring something to them that they're not getting elsewhere, whether that's through an app, through a website, um, or who knows what it could be in the future. Yeah. Okay. So that's a lot. So, so, <laughs> so, con I'm so ambitious. really what, what I'm hearing is consistency is, is kind of the minimum bar. That's like, okay, let's make sure all of, you know, the baseline stuff, uh, a consumer is having the same kind of baseline experience, but then you're layering on audience and platform sort of contextual um, content creative over and above that in some cases even more kind of experiential when you get into probably your own websites you have more flexibility etc in terms of, of of what you're doing um you know it also occurs to me and it, it, this also might be obvious but that in in i mean i would say probably the most regulated uh, consumer category, if not one of the most regulated consumer categories, man, if you can do this at Bayer, I, no one else really has an excuse because I mean, just the, the constraints that you have, I mean, legally and from a regulatory environment and everything else, like, you know, there's a, I would assume there's a lot less kind of like, let's just throw this against the wall and see what happens. Um, kind of mentality. Uh, oh that, yeah. This is, this is work? not easy. Yeah. yeah, this is not easy. Let me tell you, um, I may, I may make it sound simple, but, um, it is a collaborative project across functions. To your point, we have legal, medical, and regulatory that sees and signs off on everything. Um, so I collaborate closely with those teams and ensure compliant processes. Uh, but sometimes it makes it a little more challenging, which for me can make it a little more fun, right? Yeah. We, we don't, we sometimes have, unique barriers that we need to find solution for that uh, others m may never run into. Sure. So yes, we still need to do all the same things, uh, but we sometimes takes us a little longer to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing I want to dive into a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper is um, reviews. You, you mentioned that's kind of one of the core components of what you're, of what you're accomplishing. Um, can you give any kind of specifics or tactical stuff? Like, what are you what are you actually doing to to kind of enhance the volume and, and quality across channels? Is it different by channel, by the way, or is there is there a magic bullet solution to this that that you're going after? Oh, I wish. Um, so we we've been working with Bizarre Voice uh, for a number of years as our uh, reviews partner, and I recently, I would say, in the past two years, have taken ownership of that business relationship and just trying to make it more of an enterprise agreement. Um, in the past, our brands engaged individually with Bizarre Voice and, and didn't really feel the need to engage that much, right? It's something that you had running in the background, running reviews to your brand website, syndicating to retail, no big deal. I think when COVID hit, people started to take notice of the reviews, right? Oh, we were, we were, having a lot of conversations about, okay, people aren't going to be going in store. How are they going to know our products? How are they going to choose our products if we can't have that in-store relationship? And of course I'm over here saying, Hey, e-commerce online. Remember <laughs> it's a small little growing part, but I think it might pop now. Yeah. Um, so we decided, okay, if we can get people to convert online for our products, these are, these aren't products that people haven't used before, right? Our, our products are, are pretty, uh, widely out there. So 
if we can get good reviews, we know that leads to conversion, right? We know that uh, I think it's four stars and 200 reviews leads to a 40% conversion lift. So in, rev in looking through all of our brands, our brands weren't at that level. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe we had five reviews there, two reviews there, no reviews on some brands, just because it hadn't been a priority. Um, so after COVID and going into this year, we've had a huge push to get at least a baseline number of reviews on all of our SKUs, uh, just so people don't feel strange when buying our products. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but as a consumer, if I go onto a page and there's no reviews, I'm yeah. skeptical. <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, it's kind of a devil's advocate question because I think I know the answer, but even with Bayer aspirin, I mean, you know, an extremely recognizable brand and, and product that's been around for a hundred years, does it still matter? So I'm sure it's debatable. Uh, I, I'm never going to claim that I know 100% yes or no. Um, but I will say that the emphasis that our retail partners put on ratings and reviews does tell me something, yeah. right? I, yeah. I, I don't get to see their uh, on-page conversions as much as I'd like, but the fact that the lack of reviews would come up at JVP meetings, yep. that's a hot topic. Yep. So yep. Um, regardless, I think if you want to be a good partner to your retailers and you, and you want to provide that consumer experience, uh, it's just a new normal yeah. in terms of shopping. Hey there. I'm Dave Zimmerman with Orca Pacific. I hope you're enjoying the show. I wanted to let you know this episode is brought to you by Orca Pacific, a Mighty Hive company. We're a full service agency exclusively focused on Amazon with capabilities for everything a brand needs to succeed on the platform. From advertising strategy, content development and SEO, to merchandising and marketing. If it relates to driving and converting demand on the platform, our dedicated teams are leaders in this space. Our robust suite of services includes expertise on the back end as well, from operational support, demand forecasting and planning to the right fulfillment options, and higher level strategies like long-term planning, channel management, and access to beta programs. To learn more, visit our website at www.orcapac.com, that's O-R-C-A-P-A-C.com, and a business development manager will get you up to speed on how we can accelerate your Amazon business. Now, back to the show. You know, you, you mentioned COVID and um, I, I, I am just, this is more just curious from kind of the, the personal standpoint. Um, what was it like working inside of a, a, a healthcare company uh, focused on e-commerce during COVID? I mean, just like, were you all of a sudden getting called into meetings with, you know, people three levels above you that you'd never met? Was there added pressure? Like, was it, was it kind of... Um, uh, be careful what you wish for kind of thing. Like what, what was that experience like? Yeah, it was pretty wild. Um, and it's interesting because I started COVID on the e-commerce team and then mid COVID I moved to this new content role. So I was in it and then I was sort of observing it. Um, it was wild, right? It's, it was, it wasn't anything we hadn't been saying before. Right. And I think, um, I pat myself on the back for the early work that we did yeah. in e-commerce because that enabled us to grow share, right? Yeah. During a time when many people were struggling, we already had the e-commerce foundation set up with our retail partners to start converting online. And I think that was a huge wake up call for folks to say, oh my gosh, everything shifted and we were ready and we were, and we captured those sales. Um, so every, it, it gave everyone a lot of confidence in our e-commerce team, our e-commerce department, um, our Amazon team had to make some tough decisions and, and, and work their way through that. But I think it really elevated the work that we had been doing for so long um, and just brought it to the forefront because now uh, online became the default for so many. So, so basically you prescribe to, to this um, idea and I, and, and I do as well uh, that COVID didn't really change the trajectory of anything. It just sped up the inevitable. Basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was, okay. it and was so, almost, yeah, it was almost, no, uh, yeah, it was, it was almost, what's the word? Um, oh, I can't think of the word, but like it validating? was validating. Yes. It was like, it was a like huge, I told you so. it was a huge validation to kind Trust of, me, yeah. I think I yeah. said to someone like, 
thank God we started that little e-com business in 2016. Yeah. Like, yeah, uh, because sure. now we had to shift all everything there and, and we were ready to go. So yeah, it was definitely validating. Yeah. H have you seen that now that we're sort of, you know, starting to come out of it? Have you seen, because when COVID first hit and we were all trying to get our crystal ball out and go, okay, well, the whole world just changed, but let's try to figure out how. Um, it was my kind of general idea. And, and this wasn't totally speculative. It was based on the history I've seen with consumer behavior on Amazon, at least. It was my general idea that, you know, once people go from a traditional to a digital channel, regardless of the reason, they typically don't go back. Um, um, so it was kind of my idea that, yes, of course, everyone's, you know, in April of last year, not going to stores, but that a lot of them, once they pick up that e-commerce behavior, are just going to mostly stick with it. Um, I think we've mostly seen that be true in the industry, but I'm curious for your, from your perspective, has, has that been the case? Are people running back to stores? Is it somewhere in the middle? Um, so I have a, I have a personal p point of view, obviously. Um, I, I definitely see people returning to stores if there's a reason to, right? If you're going to provide me an experience, if there's going to be an exclusive item, if I'm going to have an awesome consumer experience, there's a reason to go in store. Um, even before COVID, the stickiness of certain e-commerce features or digital shopping features is so sticky that I used to say, once you pop, the fun don't stop. Like I literally used to use the Pringles tagline to talk yeah, yeah. about shopping on Amazon. Yeah. And so I apply that to COVID. I think so many people being forced to try these new things and now realize how easy they are. Why go back? Unless yeah. something is really pulling me there. Yeah. Um, are there experiences to be had in, in, in physical retail with um, consumer health products? Of product? course. Of okay. course there are. I mean, I'm, it's funny, I'm a very rare, or maybe I'm not, but I work in e-commerce, I preach e-commerce, and I love shopping in store. Um, so I'm, I'm a, I'm a, seeker of variety. I, I try yeah. not to buy the same things again and again, just because I like to try new stuff. Um, so I think the idea of treasure hunting, which we normally saved for a Costco or a, a store like that will become much more common. Mm. Um, even in consumer health, right? We come out with new products that have new features or new sure. benefits. Um, at a rapid pace. I mean, we're coming out with new forms. We come out with new, all sorts of stuff. And I think the exploration factor of going in store and seeing something new or exclusive uh, is really key. I, I, I tell everyone who thinks that e-commerce is really taking over to go to Trader Joe's. Um, yeah. Trader Joe's is an amazing op example of cherishing the in-store experience, honing the in-store experience, and just not focusing on e-commerce. They've, they've largely stated that is not a place they want to focus because they, they really cherish that in-tour experience. And I get that. I, I, I see them as a great example of kind of the opposite end of the spectrum from the e-commerce world. So you never want to impute your own personal behaviors onto 300 million people, right? That's always a dangerous thing. There is a Trader Joe's a half a mile from my house and I never go there because they don't deliver. So I guess I'm 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 an outlier. I'm admittedly an outlier. But have you gone? I have I I've I've gone. gone. Yeah, but not very 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 infrequently. I think I'm one of those people that just is particularly averse to like shopping in physical places. Oh, interesting. Places. Yeah. But, you know, I I think that and not to get too off on kind of a weird tangent here, but this idea of experience, I think because I get this question all the time, like, oh, you know, what what's going to happen with stores long term? And where does this all shake out? What's the eventual kind of mix? And I think we're, we're pretty closely getting into this world where the term e-commerce is not really going to make sense anymore. Because it's like, well, if you're looking at the product on your phone, on target.com, in a target, and then, you know, buying it and then pay, like, is that e-commerce? Is it what? It's just, it's all the lines. It's all commerce. So yeah, it's all exactly. commerce. But but I do think that this idea, I, I think where this eventually shakes out, and there's a question in here, um, is, um, the, is the, the, the stores, the actual stores, 
offering an experience that you cannot replicate purely in a digital environment will survive and they'll be just fine. And those that don't and don't really, you know, proactively go after that, their demise is inevitable, essentially. Like they'll just eventually be gone. And I think that, you know, the idea of, oh, well, you know, you can look at it and pick it up. And that's not, that's not what I'm talking about. That doesn't count that doesn't get us there anymore. It has to be a truly unique novel kind of um, beyond just I need this thing and I need to buy it experience. Do you agree or do you have a different perspective on that? No, I agree. I think we're going to see stores decide if they want to support an in-store experience, right? Let's say take CVS, for example. I think the way they are going to lean into minute clinics, the way they will offer self care opportunities for people with or without insurance, right? I think there's a need for that. I think other stores will look at themselves and say, should I become a warehouse for my e-commerce business? Because I'm doing so much, so much volume there. Uh, I think there's going to be choices to be made, but I definitely see an opportunity still for in-store experience. People want to do things and feel things. Um, I, I look at the social aspect and, and again, that's kind of a double entendre there. I look at the way that social media can drive experiential. Um, yeah. and that's really interesting to me. So when you, when you said you don't go to Trader Joe's, I obviously know you don't follow any of the Trader Joe's influencers because they're know. the ones yeah. who send me to Trader Joe's knowing that's that the funny. new hot item is out. So that is a big connection point for me. Uh, as new items come in, right? Various stores will tell me about it through social or through brand owned and actually drive me in store because of something. Uh, so that connection to the other touch points, I think, uh, will bring opportunities to either stay in store, go online, have a hybrid of the two. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot of changes coming, uh, in this retail world. Yeah, that's super interesting. Yeah. I think, I do think that kind of, um, North Star of experience, though, is a good one for the industry to kind of calibrate itself around. And I, I, I think you're going to get into that, like people trying to game it going like, oh, well, they're experiencing like picking the banana up and looking at it like, no, that's not that's not like what we're talking about here. But but I yeah, I think that's a, a super interesting framework. So um, Alana, this has been this has been fascinating. Uh, really appreciate you coming on. Anything you want to share with the audience or, or point them in, in any direction um, uh, before uh, we take off here? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Um, I'm pretty active everywhere on LinkedIn. Folks can find me, Alana Joy Feldman. Um, and I'm a huge Twitter uh, enthusiast uh, as well. Okay. So at DigiAJF, you can find me there uh, and we'll keep in touch. That's awesome. Yeah, we'll throw that in the show notes as well so people can uh, follow you and, and connect with you. Um, hey, thanks again for being on. Thanks. Thanks for having me.